Okay. Today we're going to continue, or actually we're going to start. Today we're going to start a new series. Okay, and I'm really stoked about this series because we're going to be covering 1 Kings. We're moving back to the Old Testament. Uh, there are so many great books in the Old Testament, and this is definitely one of them. Uh, and what you'll find in the Old Testament is a lot of the stories that you read, they're not only true, they not only teach you valuable church history, uh, but there's also so many applicable lessons to be learned that you can apply to your life today. Uh, the Old Testament isn't done away with. Just the law has been fulfilled, but the stories and the lessons that are brought out of the Old Testament are still amazing. Now, we thought long and hard, what creative title could we give First Kings? Something powerful, something you know, insightful. So we decided to call it Kings. This series <laughs> is called Kings. So anyway, uh, but before we jump into our main text, I wanted to take a little time uh, to set some framework. Because First Kings actually begins toward the end of David's life. I mean, we are in the twilight of his life, and I think it's so important that you understand who King David is and who he was as a man and as a king, uh, because David's life will help you understand a lot of the things we're going to be studying uh, in 1 Kings. So I'm going to try, and I want you to realize I said try. I'm going to try. I'm going to try to consolidate into three messages the highlights of David's life. I know. But anyway... I, I think it's really important. I'm just going to hit some highlights that I think will give you a good idea of who he was so that as we progress through Kings, you'll understand some of the references that are made. Now, the three messages we're going to look at, the three events in his life, uh, are first, today's message, which is how God chose David to be the king of Israel. Uh, the second thing we'll look at next week is David's first major conquest when he faced Goliath. There we go, Goliath. I love preaching that story because... Most people hear that story or read about it, you know, in a cartoon or anything, and they come out saying, the lesson is little people can beat up big people if they love Jesus, and that's, that's really not the lesson. So we're going to take a look at that because that's a very important milestone in David's life. Uh, and then the last message we'll look at uh, is David and Bathsheba, his sin with Bathsheba and his, and his repentance that soon followed. So those are the three things, Lord willing, we're going to look at. So let's jump into today because today we're going to cover how God chose David uh, to be the king of Israel. Now, I want you to remember something as we go through this, because like I said, it's always applicable, right? There are two sides of every human being alive, okay? Two sides of every human being alive, right? There's the person that everyone thinks you are and the person that God knows you are, okay? And a lot of people hear that and they go, oh, no, I'm the same. And I'm like, oh, bless your heart, you're a liar, <laughs> because I'm gentle like that. But um, there, we can't help it. There are times that we alter who we are according to the company we're in. And, you know, it's a shame, but that's, that's the way it is, right? And, and the person that people think we are come from us allowing them to know only so much. So sometimes they, they think what they think about us by what we've allowed them to see, and sometimes they think what they think of us because that's what they want to think. That's what they want to believe, okay? But here's the thing. See, man only has the ability to see what's on the surface. They only have a limited capability of understanding other men, other mankind, right? But God has the ability to see the very thoughts and intentions of your heart. God knows why you do everything you do. And God sees things in a way we can't. So I always say, I think that if, if you can just worry about being pleasing to God and not worry about anybody else, people will see God in you as a result of that. So, okay, let's jump in. Now, Saul, not to be mistaken with Saul in the New Testament. This is King Saul, 900 and some years before Jesus. Okay, I wanted to get that out there. Uh, but King Saul was the reigning king of Israel at the time uh, we're about to discuss. Okay, now, he was not God's choice as king. As a matter of fact, God didn't even want Israel to have a king. He wanted it to be a theocracy, which means he wanted it to be God to be their king and the men of God to, to instruct people by the word of God and then let God guide them. That was his design. But they started seeing, just like today, you know there's keeping up with the Joneses, right? They started seeing all the other kingdoms around them had these beautiful kingdoms and palaces and kings arrayed in long, fine robes with you know, their big entourage, and, and it just looked so elegant and royal. So they wanted a king, and they would not be satisfied until God finally allowed them to have a king. He said, okay, and, and Samuel felt rejected because he tried to talk them out of having a king. And God said, don't worry, it's not you that they're rejecting. They're rejecting me. So he allowed them to have this king, 
but he gave him a warning. He said, I'll let you have this king, but there's going to be consequences, right? Because he said, when you have a man running things, if you're going to be uh, under the, the reign of a human king, you're going to suffer. You and your families will suffer as long as a, there's a human king that is in charge. And it's going to be that way as long as it, as, it, as it exists. And even a brief look at Jewish history will show that all the heartache and all the pain and all the wars and all the things that came to pass because they had to have a king. Now, I think it's interesting how they chose Saul as the king. You would think it would be because of his brilliant, you know, military prowls, or, or you would think it would be because he was so intelligent or he was so well-spoken or, you know, he had wisdom in problem-solving. They chose him because they thought he was hot. That's, that, I mean, that's why they chose him, right? Because apparently, it's not like this now, but apparently, you know, people give breaks to good-looking people. I mean, that's weird. We don't even know that concept now, do we? But that's how they chose him. Look at 1 Samuel chapter 9, starting in verse 2. It says, he had a son whose name was Saul, a choice and handsome man. And there was not a more handsome person than he among the sons of Israel. For his shoulders, uh, from his shoulders and up, he was taller than any of the people. So basically, they went to look for the biggest, best looking guy they could and made him king. So if I would have been alive then, I'd have been king. <laughs> no, I'm no, just kidding. Anyway, no. But that's how they chose him. Right, And it's the same today. Have you ever noticed that, that, that some people get breaks on how they look? Have you ever noticed that? It was the same way then. Okay, so Saul became king based on that. Now, Saul started off okay. And when I say started off, I mean very briefly he started out okay. But because he's a man, he was easily filled with pride. He was easily drunken with power. And so uh, soon after becoming king, he started disobeying God. And one start first in small ways, then bigger and bigger ways. But when Saul disobeyed God's orders with the Amalekites, that was the final straw for God. See, God wanted Saul to, uh, to go to war with the Amalekites, and he wanted them to, now listen, he wanted them to utterly be destroyed, wiped out. Okay, wiped out. I'll explain that here in a minute. So God said, Samuel, tell Saul this is what I want him to do. Listen to this, 1 Samuel 15.1. It says, one day Samuel said to Saul, uh, it was the Lord who told me to anoint you as king of, of his people, Israel. Now, listen to the message from the Lord. This is what the Lord of heaven's armies has declared. I have decided to settle accounts with the nation of Amalek for opposing Israel when they came from Egypt. Now, go and completely destroy the entire Amalekite nation, men, women, children, babies, cattle, sheep, goats, camels, and donkeys. Anybody have any questions after that? <laughs> we're going to cover that. Okay, we're going to cover that. Just give me time here, all right? So first of all, who were the Amalekites, and why were they so detestable to God, and why did he want to wipe them out? The Amalekites were descendants and followers of Amalek. Now, how many people remember Jacob and Esau in the Bible? They were the, anybody remember those? Okay, anyway, Jacob and Esau. Now, Jacob was the son of God that, that, that went after God's ways and chose to do the things God wanted him to do. But Esau, his brother, did evil in the sight of God. Amalek was Esau's grandson. Okay, that's who Amalek was. And because, uh, you know, because he came from a lineage of people who were rebellion against, uh, rebelling against God, the people that followed him also rebelled against God. Now, I want you to understand how evil they were. The Amalekites became some of the wickedest people the world has ever known. We're talking all kinds of terrible atrocities, human sacrifices, things you just can't even imagine, right? And they hated Israel, and they hated the God of Israel. And their goal in life was to wipe Israel off the planet and the thought of their God with them. They wanted him gone. They were the complete enemy of God and of Israel. And they had been attacking Israel, trying to destroy them for two to four hundred years before Saul it was even alive. So this isn't something that just flared up, okay? They had been after them forever, right? And they were so cruel. I mean, they were some of the most cruel people you could imagine because they were merciless. They would come in and attack Israel, and they would kill everything they laid eyes on, 
And when they left, just in case they missed somebody, they were afraid somebody would survive. They would burn down all the structures, kill all the livestock, and burn all the crops. So if anybody did survive, they'd die of starvation. Okay, so they were not the welcome wagon. All right, these are some rough people. They actually were that, the dirty kind of fighter, too. They would wait until Israel was at their weakest before they would attack them, like if they had just started a, if they just come through a plague or, or if they'd just come back from battle and were depleted and wounded. That's when they would always come and attack. But their goal was to wipe them off the face of the earth. Now, I know what you're thinking. Why women, children, and infants? How many people were thinking that? Okay, good, because I'm going to answer it. Here's why. God knew those children would grow up to be just like their parents. Okay, for generation after generation after generation after generation, they raised their children, understanding it was so important that they followed idol gods, that they were just as cruel, just as brutal, and hated God and Israel just as much as they did. And left unchecked, the next generation would have been raised up to hate God. They would have continued attacking Israel and eventually would have ended up dying and going to hell. Okay? This way, when God said, kill everything, I know it sounds cruel, but this is actually God being gracious. Because remember, children are not accountable for their sin. They can't be held guilty. So all the children and babies that died would immediately be in heaven. He actually saved generations from ending up going to hell. I know that's hard for us to understand. We think, gosh, that seems like such a harsh way to handle it. But the thing you have to remember is that God doesn't require us to understand his ways for his ways to be right. And they were right. So this is, this is who those people were, and this is why uh, he wanted them taken out. Now, the reason he wanted the livestock taken out was he didn't want the surrounding nations thinking they were just attacking the Amalekites so they could have their stuff. Because a lot of kingdoms would just raid another kingdom so they could have their gold and their women and their cows. And the, I probably shouldn't have said those back to back. But anyway, they wanted to... The, <laughs> I'm just kidding. But they didn't want the neighboring nations to think that they just were plundering them. That's why they were attacking them. They wanted them to understand that. Right? So that kind of gives you the background on that. But Saul, in this instance... Now remember, this is the mortal enemy of God. But Saul chose to disobey God and did the very opposite of what he asked them to do. Even spared the king of the Amalekites. Okay, listen to this. 1 Samuel 15, 10. It says, Then the Lord said to Samuel, I am sorry that I ever made Saul king, for he has not been loyal to me and has refused to obey my command. Samuel was so deeply moved when he heard this that he cried out uh, to the Lord all night. Early the next morning, Samuel went to find Saul, and someone told him Saul went to the town of Carmel to set up a monument to himself. Anybody see a problem? He was drunk with power. He started feeling like it was all about him. Listen, I mean, this is why God didn't want them to have a king. Men can't handle that kind of power. It says uh, to set up a monument to himself. So then he went to Gilgal. I think this is funny. Watch how fake this is. When Samuel finally found him, Saul greeted him cheerfully. May the Lord bless you, he said. I have carried out the Lord's command. I think that's so funny because you know when he saw Samuel coming, the prophet, he's like, oh, man, we are so busted. So he fakes it. He fakes it. Hey, Samuel, homie, what's up? Just over here doing my God business. You know what I mean? Acting like everything was great, right? He says, I have carried out the Lord's commands. Now listen, it says, then what is all the bleeding of sheep and goats and the lowing of cattle I hear? Samuel demanded. I think that's hilarious. All the livestock was still behind him. They hadn't hidden them yet. So they're like, we did exactly what God wanted. And he goes, really? Because I hear cows and I hear sheep. So why am I hearing that? Saul, right? Okay. Listen to Saul's reply. It is, uh, it's true that the army spared the best of the sheep, goats, and cattle, Saul admitted, but they are going to sacrifice them to the Lord your God. We have destroyed everything else. Then Samuel said to Saul, stop, listen to what the Lord told me last night. What did he tell you? Saul asked. And Samuel told him, although you may think little of yourself, are you not the leader of the tribes of Israel? The Lord has anointed you king of Israel, and the Lord sent you on a mission and told you, go and completely destroy the sinners, the Amalekites, until they are all dead. Why haven't you obeyed the Lord? Why did you rush for the plunder and do what is evil in the Lord's sight? Now listen, he says, but I did obey the Lord, Saul insisted. I carried out the mission he gave me. I brought back the king, of, the, the king Agag, but I destroyed everyone else. Is that destroying everybody? 
He brought back their king, verse 21. And he says, uh, then my troops brought in the best of the sheep, goats, cattle, and plunder to sacrifice to the Lord your God in Gilgal. Do you think he was really going to do that? He might have, you know, brought a few straggly beasts in there to cut up. But they were going to... They were going to split this up. They were just busted, okay? Verse 22, but Samuel replied, what is more pleasing to the Lord, your burnt offerings and sacrifices or your obedience to his voice? Listen, obedience is better than sacrifice and submission is better than offering the fat of rams. Rebellion is as sinful as witchcraft and stubbornness as bad as worshiping idols. So because you have rejected the command of the Lord, he has rejected you as king. I want to stop for a second. I love what verse 22 is saying, because this is describing religion. Okay, listen, this is describing religion. He says, what is more pleasing to the Lord, your burnt offerings and sacrifices or your obedience to his voice? There are so many times that people get caught up with doing the things the church wants you to do, whatever denomination you belong to, keeping all of the ordinances, doing all the, you know, all the things they ask you to do, following all the rules, but not following God. And they think that you can actually be a good believer by being religious, not being obedient. And he's saying, listen, God wants you to be obedient. He wants you to listen to his voice. That is what impresses God, not how well you follow the religious rules. That's not impressive to him. Okay, so Saul basically did everything he was told not to do. And what makes it worse is then he tried to lie about it. Then when he was busted about lying about it, then he tries to get all religious and justify it. Well, I thought maybe God forgot that I could offer these as sacrifices. Maybe he overlooked that, you know? Oh, I spared the king, you know, I figured God would want me. You know, he just made excuses because he didn't want to be obedient, right? And so Saul tells him he has been rejected as king, and God tells uh, Saul to go out, or Samuel to go out and find another king. So let's move and take a look at that. 1 Samuel 16, 1 through 3. Now the Lord said to Samuel, how long will you grieve over Saul since I have rejected him from being king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and go. I will send you uh, to Jesse, the Bethlehemite, for I have selected a king for myself among his sons. But Samuel said, how can I go? When Saul hears of it, he will kill me. And the Lord said, take a heifer, (laughs) take a, (laughs) shut up. You guys are terrible. I could have totally went through that if you hadn't laughed about that. (laughs) Anyway, uh, but but Samuel said, (laughs) how can I? (laughs) So many jokes, so little time. But Samuel said, how can I go? When Saul hears of it, he will kill me. And the Lord said, take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. You shall invite Jesse to the sacrifice and I will show you what you shall do. And you shall anoint for me the one whom I designate to you. So here's the thing. God let Israel pick the first king, and they blew it. So he said, listen, this time I'm going to pick the king. It's going to be me. 1 Samuel 16, 4. So Samuel did uh, what the Lord said and came to Bethlehem, and the elder, listen to this, and the elders of the city came trembling to meet him and said, do you come in peace? That's got to make you feel good. Verse 5, he said, in peace. I have come to, uh, to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourselves and come with me to the sacrifice. He also consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. Now, I'm going to go on kind of a, a rant here for a second, or we'll just call it a rabbit running. It still pertains. But I think it's funny how the elders reacted to Samuel's arrival at Bethel. Because, see, back then, when you saw a prophet of God coming, it meant one of two things. It meant either he was coming to bless you, or he was coming to pronounce God's judgment on you. That's generally what it meant when you saw one of them coming. I think there were some guilty conscience people here, don't you? Because the first thing they think is, oh man, how did he know? Here he comes. They were all immediately afraid of him, right? And they, and they, they come out there to meet him because they're scared to death why he's coming into that town. Now you got to think that had to be tough for Samuel. That had to be really tough for him because no one wants to be looked at like that. I call it being looked at like the principal. Who wants the principal around, right? Is somebody here a principal? (laughs) Praise God. Anyway, nobody wants the principal around, you know what I mean? And so when people come around and they would, you know, be afraid of what he was going to say, I imagine that was definitely difficult for him, right? That had to be tough. But here's the thing. Leadership is full of difficult situations. 
It's full of difficult situations. And, and here's the thing. So many people look at the leadership position and look at it as the glorious position where they get all the credit, right? And see, the prophets at that time were considered uh, important spiritual leaders of Israel. So there were probably some people thinking, wow, he's got the job now. He's got the good job. But they didn't understand the immense pressure Samuel was under. Think about it. He was responsible for millions of people listening to what God had to say, telling them what God had to say, even when they didn't want to hear it. How many people want to go before a king and accuse them? This is what he had to do because this is what God wanted them to do. How many people in here are in management of any kind? Raise your hand. Don't you love it when people will say, oh, I want that cushy job being the manager. They don't do nothing. <laughs> you know, they don't have to do reports. They don't get yelled at from the people who own the company. They don't, you know, get fired for your terrible work, right? They don't understand. People always want to be in a position they shouldn't be in. And this is the way it was then. This was a very powerful position. And the, 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 I mean, I can't even imagine the stress that he had to face, the immense pressure he was under. But if you've been a manager or if you've been in management, you understand on some scale. And as a pastor, I do understand on a small scale what this meant. I get it. Because believe me, as a pastor, I hear people all the time treating me like the principal or the fun sucker. Right? You'll come into a room and they'll stop talking. Shh, 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 shh. Which tells me they were saying something they probably shouldn't have been saying anyway. Right? Or they'll, 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 they, you know, they'll drop the F-bomb or something. They'll go, oh, I'm, I'm sorry, pardon my language. I'm like, why are you apologizing to me? You know what I mean? It wasn't me that said, you know, I, nothing I could do about it. You know, but they think, you know, if Pastor Chris doesn't know what we do, then God doesn't know what we do. <laughs> right? So it, I'm going to be honest with you. I don't like that. I don't like that because I'm a man just like anybody else and I sin like anybody else and I don't want to be treated like the principal, <laughs> right? But that's just the beginning. It, it, and I'm going to go on a little bit of a rant because it always bothers me when people desire something that God didn't want them to do. Uh, and often they come off kind of sharp. I've had people tell me before, well, you've got the prominent job. You've got the job where you get all the glory. <laughs> and this is going to sound really sinful. But when people say that, I just want to slap the taste out of their mouth. You know, because let's be honest, they have no idea what it entails. They forget pastors do sometimes get all the glory, but we also get all the blame, all the judgment, and everybody's favorite, we get all the complaints. And if you'd like to be my complaint department, I will share that with you. You see, when they forget that we get that too, they forget that the glory also includes sleepless nights, being with people in their most dire of sorrowful times and having to carry that, right? The time that you miss from your family, that all comes with the glory of leadership. Now listen, don't take me wrong. I love my job, and I wouldn't trade it for the world. I love every aspect of it, but that's because God called me to do this. So those things that I just read to you that sound like something that would make you run, don't scare me because God called me to this, and he enables me to do this. So I love my job, but my point in telling you that is that you have to remember, if God isn't calling you to a ministry, don't pursue that ministry. And if God hasn't called you to that ministry, don't judge that ministry. Because trust me, trust me, there's always someone that thinks they can do it better. There's always someone that thinks they've got a better idea or they're smarter or knew how you should have done it, right? If God isn't calling you to this, do whatever he calls you to do and leave this the heck alone, right? But here's the thing. The most valuable ministry to you is the one that God calls you to. And whatever that is, what other people see as a curse to that, you won't be bothered by it. Like, for instance, I am not called to that ministry, ever. I never have been to the ministry of the nursery, rather. I've, never been, I've not been called to that, ever. That nursery ministry, those people will get a bigger reward in heaven than me. Probably triple. I probably won't even be able to see them in front of the line <laughs> from where I'm at. That is not my ministry. And when I see kids screaming and kids throwing stuff and hitting other kids and parents yelling at them, I think to myself, that is a terrible job. But the people who love to work with kids wouldn't trade it for the world. They wouldn't trade that blessing. And we have great nursery staff and, and great you know, Sunday school staff that is really underappreciated because the things they do are amazing. And the things that we look at as being, making that job difficult to them is just part of a job that they love. Because when you wait for the calling God has for you, then you will enjoy what you're doing. But listen, I want to throw this in too. There is no ministry or calling that is defined as you criticizing other people who are actually doing something. That's not a calling, okay? There's no calling for you to judge other people's ministries. 
If you have time to judge other people's ministries, you're not doing anything yourself, right? There's no calling for that. Here's the thing we have to remember. Ministry isn't about you. It's not about what people think of you. It's not about what you think of other people. Here's what ministry is about. It's about glorifying God. It's about seeking his wisdom and direction. It's about submitting your will to the will of God. And I can't think of anybody that displayed that more than Samuel. No one. The things that he was put through, yet he stuck to it and did what God told him to do. He was faithful all those years and God used him in so many powerful ways because he was called to do that. And the very thing that God is asking him to do right now displays how faithful he was. Because I don't think you understand, if Saul were to find out that Samuel was about to anoint another king while he is sitting on the throne, he'd put him to death. And probably whoever he was anointing as king, he would put to death also. This took a great act of faith. So, jumping back in, right? Uh, God said that he had chosen one of Jesse's sons. One of Jesse's sons. So he had it narrowed down to that. Uh, and so Samuel asked to see them. Let's look at this. First Samuel 16, 6. It says, when they entered, he looked at Eliab, this is one of the sons of Jesse, and thought, surely the, Lord anointed, uh, the Lord's anointed is before him. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not look at his appearance or the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. Now listen, for God sees not as a man sees, for man looks at the outward, outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. When the Bible says heart, it talks about our inner person, who we really are, our thoughts and intentions. That's what God sees. See, Eliab, one of Jesse's sons, was the quintessential stereotype for what Israel would want as a king. He was big and strong and good looking and well thought of. And they would have been so happy if he would have picked Eliab as king, but they would have been wrong again. As you'll see, we'll learn a little bit more about him later. They would have been wrong again because the outside of a person doesn't tell us anything about the inside of a person. Doesn't tell us anything, right? So I love what God said about this. Let's read it again. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not look at his appearance uh, at the height of his stature because I have rejected him. For God sees not as man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Listen, Christians, I'm going to be honest with you. We're, sometimes we're terrible at this. We make judgments by what we see on someone outside. And you are never more like the enemy than when you do that. Right? Listen, I'll never forget there was a young man when I was still an associate pastor and I was preaching on a Wednesday night one night and there was a guy who I went to school with who I used to do things with in uh, illegal stuff, things with. But anyway, and he came in and his life had been destroyed by drugs and alcohol. And he comes in wearing a baseball cap and like, I don't know, Metallica t-shirt, something like that, which, cool, I like them. Anyway, and one of the deacons or elders, I can't remember, walked to the back, and I was so excited to see him there. I knew how deep he had gotten into the drug culture. And he walks to the back, and he says, either take that hat off, son, or leave. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. I couldn't believe that Christianity had been, had been downgraded to that kind of foolishness to where someone would judge somebody by what they wear, where somebody would judge somebody for, for their gender or ethnicity or age or race or anything like that. And I, I couldn't believe what I was hearing. But praise God, he was more mature than, that, than the self-righteous guy that came up to him. So he pulled his hat off and he stayed. And he got saved that night. About four weeks later, he was in a car accident and died. Now, Died with his Bible. All right? And now listen, imagine if he would have talked that man into leaving the building for what he was wearing before he got to hear the gospel message. You know, I don't want any part of Christianity that's like that. That kind of church somebody else can have, that'll never be this church. He could have cost that man hearing the gospel. We can't look at the outside because God sees past that masquerade we have on the outside. That one we put on for people, God sees past that. He sees right into our heart. He sees whether we're generous or not. He sees whether we're compassionate or not. He sees whether we're loving or forgiving or not. He sees those things. And he judges us accurately by what he sees in here. But no man can judge by what he sees out here. 
No man can judge by that. I had someone one time say that there was a man with long hair, and he said, don't you think he should cut that hair now that he's a Christian? I said, no, I wish to God I had his long hair. <laughs> I do. I'm not kidding you. If I could have hair like that, it'd be, I'd be like, share. <laughs> Down to here, man. That's a bad example. Anyway, we can't be like that. So eventually, <laughs> eventually, Samuel meets uh, all of Jesse's sons but one. And none of them are chosen. Look at this. 1 Samuel 16, 8. It says, Then Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel, and he said, The Lord has not chosen this one either. Imagine how frustrated Samuel is at this time. Being there is risking his life. And he's marching, he's parading these young studs in front of him, and God's not picking any of them. And he's probably thinking, Come on, i got to get out of here, right? Okay, verse 9. Then Jesse uh, made Shema pass by, and he said, The Lord has not chosen this one either. Then Jesse made seven of his sons pass before Samuel, but Samuel said to Jesse, the Lord has not chosen these. So imagine how frustrated Samuel is at this point. Now, he knew God said it was from the sons of Jesse, but he hadn't seen him yet, right? So the problem, and Samuel didn't know this at the time, was that Jesse had mistakenly assumed that God would choose by his standards instead of God's standards. Because in Jesse's eyes, he's like, God wouldn't want my youngest son. I mean, he's basically a boy. He's had no life experiences. He's never served in the army. He's not well-versed, you know, like as a priest or anything. He doesn't really have anything redeeming about him. He takes care of sheep. Surely, God doesn't want to see the pipsqueak, so you stay out here and work. Right? That was his opinion. And so he didn't even call his youngest son. Imagine how that would make you feel. Hey, God has chosen one of you. Not you. You stay. <laughs> right? Didn't even call him. Right? Didn't even have him come out there. Right? Now listen, this makes me think of how people think today. I mean, people and believers or not, sometimes we reason without any good reason. You know that? Sometimes we reason without any good reason. Because we believe what we want to about people based on our bias. Right? That's what we believe. That's what we choose to believe about people. God's decisions are made on his omniscience or his all-knowing. All right? So... I mean, that's why I just believe that the only thing you should focus on is not what people think about you, not pleasing other people, but being pleasing to God. If you can be pleasing to God, you'll find out that what they think of you and trying to please other people is a waste of time. Pleasing God's where your success will come from, right? But anyway, and plus it makes your life way easier. Let's move on. 1 Samuel 16, 11 says, Then Jesse uh, made seven of his sons pass before Samuel, but Samuel said to Jesse, the Lord has not chosen these. And, Sam, uh, and Saul, sa I'm sorry, and Samuel said to Jesse, are these all the children? And he said, well, there remains the youngest, and behold, he is tending the sheep. Then Samuel said to Jesse, send and bring him, for we will not sit down until he comes here. Okay? I wonder how that was said. He sat through all that, and he held back a son. And when he found out he had another one, can you imagine him going, what? There's a, get him, stupid. That's basically the Chris Mosley version of what he was saying there. Okay, verse 12. So he sent and brought him in. Uh, and brought him in. Now, he was ruddy. Oh, I want to talk about that word. We'll get to that. We'll talk about that word here in a minute. Now, he was ruddy with beautiful eyes and, handsome, uh, and a handsome appearance. And the Lord said, arise, anoint him, for this is he. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. Remember that. And here's something I want you to pay careful attention to. This is going to be important. And the Spirit of the Lord, that's the Holy Spirit, right? We all agree there? Capital S. And the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon David from that day, what? Forward. And Samuel arose and went to Ramah. This is the only Old Testament personality that we can prove was fully indwelt with the Holy Spirit. It didn't come and go like it did with some of the other ones. He was fully indwelt with the Holy Spirit. Okay, that's going to be important. From this moment on, and he was a boy, all right? We'll look at that later. So Samuel, being frustrated, finally gets to meet the right one. He says, get him over here, and he cracks open the horn of oil, and he anoints him king. Right now, David is described as being ruddy, having beautiful eyes, and being handsome. Now, the word ruddy in Hebrew means reddish, means reddish. Hey, I, I'm just giving you the facts. <laughs> Unfortunately, a lot of people think this means that he was redheaded. As much as I would love to lay claim to that, it's not what it means. Okay, the word just means reddish, and it was actually describing his complexion. 
It's a word they would use to describe someone who worked outside a lot. They were in the sun a lot, so they would always have kind of a red appearance. Even people who tan easy get that reddish appearance when they're outside all the time, right? He had that reddish appearance. I'd love to say he's redheaded. Maybe he was, but I doubt it. I haven't seen a lot of redheaded Jewish people. Anyway, <laughs> but that's what it means by ruddy, so I just wanted to kill you know, that thing, but it was referring to his skin tone. But so, so David... There's a few things we see just in this brief story, and then I'll close, that tell us a little bit about David's character. First of all, David stayed back to take care of the sheep, and that displayed his faithfulness. See, when a prophet would come to town, okay, I'm going to do this again. All right. How many people have ever seen Lord of the Rings? Come on. How many people have seen Lord of the Rings? There we go. I love that movie, and if you think I'm unrighteous, I don't care. I like that movie. Remember when Gandalf came to town and all the little kids were running to him and everybody like in the town came? That's what it was like when a prophet would come to town. I mean, they didn't get to see him very often. And so when, when he would come, they were wanting to see why. Is he coming to bring blessing? Is he coming to tell us about a judgment? People would drop whatever they were doing and run to see the prophet. David didn't because his father left him in charge of the sheep. And he knew if he left the sheep that someone could steal him, that a predator could come and, and kill him. And he had a sense of duty to the responsibilities his father gave him, and he stayed right there, probably the only one who did. So that spoke highly of his character, right? That was one thing that spoke very highly of his character. He stayed about his business, right? Here's another thing. David was able to handle being, being anointed king at this young age, despite the fact that there was a king already on the throne. Now, there are not many young men that could do this. He never said a word about being anointed until it was God's timing to reveal him to the people. Not a word. You know why? Because he trusted God's timing. You know what most young men would do? They'd be like, yeah, king, baby. You know, they, can you imagine them walking? He'd probably walk into the palace and go, you are sitting in my seat, brother. Get out. God anointed me king. You were never supposed to be anyway. Right? He could have bossed people around. He could have told his brothers, you take care of the dang sheep. I'm the king. Didn't you hear that? He didn't do any of that because God saw his heart that he was humble, that he was faithful, and that he was willing to serve without credit. So being the anointed king, he remained silent until the day that God was willing to reveal him as king. And that speaks highly, very highly of his character, right? I mean, massively highly of his character. And I just, I just don't think there's a lot of people that have that kind of integrity that David had. And it, now you're going to see him wane as we talk about some other things in his life, but this was definitely the reason God chose him. Right? Now listen, here's something that, that's really important I want you to take from this message, because I've I got to close very, pretty quickly here. But you see all these things, I've given you the facts for the next message, but there's one thing to take from this, I hope it's this. God sees what we're capable of. He knows what we're capable of. So if God calls you to something, a ministry, or puts you in a ministry, then you are capable of being successful at that ministry because he will empower you to be successful at that ministry. That's why he put you there. He knows you have the capabilities. So to not accept it with everything you have is to question what God knows. If God is calling you to do something, do it. He wouldn't have called you if you were not capable. And don't worry about whether anybody else thinks you are or not. They're not the one you'll stand before. Remember this. Another thing, if you want to know about God's wisdom in your life, ask for it. It's one of my favorite passages, James 1.5. It says, but if any of you lacks wisdom, let him what? Ask of God, who gives to all generously and without reproach, and what? It will be given to you. Not maybe. It will be given to you. When people say, I don't understand the Bible, I have to tell them, do you really want to? Because if you want to and ask, you will. He'll reveal it to you. And here's another one. I, I, I love this. If, if, listen, if you want to know how to be on path of success, here it is. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. One of my favorite parts of the Psalms. And people hear that and go, great bumper sticker. But it's more than that. Listen, listen carefully. Your word, your word is a lamp. Your word is a lamp. To, what is a lamp to our feet? Oh, don't do that. Well, we'll just go back. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Your word. What is a lamp to our feet? Word. His word. If you want to know where God wants you to be, read his word. 
Because I'm telling you, if you're not, you won't know. You will not know. This is your Google Maps spiritually right here. You want to, be, to know you're walking in the, on the right path where God wants you to go? Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. And if you do that, I promise you those paths will lead to success. I'm going to go ahead and stop there. I'm going to ask you what to please bow your heads. If this is your first time, we always give an invitation. Basically, if you're here and you're not sure where you stand with God, I'm nobody's judge and none of us can tell by looking. But here's what I do know. He doesn't love me any more than he loves you. And just as badly as he wanted me to be one of his, he wants you to be one of his. And if you'd like me to pray for you, and I'm not going to chase you down or any of that stuff, I don't believe in that. I just literally want to pray for you. Just make eye contact and put your head right back down or just slip your hand up, anything. Bless those people. And I'm going to pray for you. Bless those people. Because listen, the only thing that's holding you back, bless those people, is surrendering because that's all he requires. And listen, believers, I'm going to pray for us because, oh, there's so much to be learned in these Old Testament books, so many lessons to be applied, and they all... They all circle around one main theme, and that is those who submit and trust God can do amazing things. We're all capable of that. Let's pray. God, I thank you so much for all that you do. I thank you for your love and your mercy and your compassion, and I just thank you so much, God, that you look inside our hearts and see how far we fall from perfection. You see the blackness of sin in our lives, and you love us despite us, not because of us, you know we're imperfect. You know we make mistakes. You know we sin. And yet you still offer your grace to us, and that just amazes me. If there's someone here who doesn't know you, I just pray, God, that, that whatever it is that's holding them back, you just move it out of the way. Let them trust that what Jesus did was enough to guarantee their eternal life, and your word promises they'll have it. God, if they make that decision, I pray they reach out to us or to a good Christian friend or organization near them. And Lord, for those of us who know you, God, light a fire in us. Let us learn to trust you. Let us learn to let your word guide us and lead us so that we can do the amazing things we only read about. Father, we thank you for all that you do. We ask you to go with us and keep us safe. And we ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.